um, came up with the idea and how the paper actually appeared, which is slightly different than the story that's actually written in the paper, but I think this is more fun. But just a bird's eye view before we start, um, you know, more technically, the whole point of this is to understand whether or not theory QFTs are free, are approximately free at the past infinity and at future infinity. Because when we do calculations in flat space time, we're a scattering matrix, we assume we have particle states at future infinity and at past infinity, and we assume that they are approximately free. And the vague, uh, the bird's eye view is to try to understand to what extent is that true if we move away from the very specific zero temperature Minkowski space time limit? But let's start with the actual story. How did this all begin? This all began with me trying to understand how to add interactions to Hawking radiation. So let's review a little bit about uh, how QFT and curved space time works. Because in flat space time, everything is easy. We have a time translation symmetry that gives us a unique definition of positive and negative frequency, which gives us creation and annihilation operators, particles, unique vacuum, everything. But in curved space time, we do not have that symmetry in general. And it turns out there's no unique vacuum. And it's not like we have the, the different vacua that we can map one to another. So they're uh, equivalent physics. No, they de describe inequivalent physics. They are different Hilbert spaces even. Um, we don't, in general, have well-defined particles and calculations get really hard when we're in curved space time. And when you learn this in your master's degree in black holes, you either despair and you say, I'm never going to deal with QFT in curved space time again, or you say, okay, this is really cool. There's some interesting new physics. And luckily for us, Stephen Hawking was the, the latter kind. And what he considered was um, a black hole collapse because his main idea was, okay, I have the matter that's close to center, which I've represented here in, by, by this shaded area in this Penrose diagram, but very far away from the matter, if this is asymptotically flat, then I have an asymptotic time translation symmetry. So here in past infinity and at future infinity, that I, I can get away with the usual flat space time using time translation symmetry to get me a good definition of particles. Despite the fact that in the middle, there is a lot of dynamical things happening. What might happen is that the definition of particles of future and past be very different because in the middle, we had some dynamical matter collapsing. So his question was, what happens if I put no particles in the past? What do I measure in the future? And the answer that we probably all know very well um, is that we measure a finite temperature with this temperature, the Hawking temperature, um, at the future um, infinity. This kickstart the whole black hole information paradox. What does it mean for me to measure a finite temperature? This has been extended to all kinds of fields, all kinds of black holes. It's very robust. But the one thing that this isn't robust against is interactions. The original calculation was very much about defining particle states, about this Bogolyubov transformations. You can maybe do um, a change a little bit the way you're doing, talking about Hadamard states. But most of all, you're always talking about solving the linear equation of motion. You're always talking about the free theory. So a natural question to ask is, okay, we have this very amazing result, like truly amazing result, but how can we generalize this away from the free theory? How can we add interactions? This is precisely what Ahmedov and collaborators did in 2016. They considered a very, a very specific collapse model. And I say very specific with, with reason. They consider a thin shell that starts at some radius R0 that's very close to the Schwarzschild radius and is stationary. Then at some point starts to decay and then decelerates again uh, before reaching the Schwarzschild radius. So all of these approximations are crucial for them to actually do some analytics. Um, but despite the very maybe unnatural specificity of how the, the, the collapse actually happened, what they manage is something quite impressive. They calculate the energy flux at the horizon, the full energy momentum tensor, uh, which if you know anything about QFT in curved space, I mean, you know, this is very hard because you need the regularizing um, divergences in curved space time is a mess. Um, and for future reference, what the energy momentum tensor needs is this expectation value of the anti commutator which I'll call the symmetric two-point function, and uh, specifically in the coincidence limit. Oh, it also needs some derivatives of this. It's more complicated to go from the symmetric two-point function to the energy momentum tensor, but this is the basic object that gives us some physics. 
Um, so this is what they calculated. At the three level, they recover Hawking's results. So their results have a chance of being correct. And, but the problem is that at two loops, what they find is that the results are proportional to T, um, the time where um, the um, stress tensor is evaluated. And well, if we wait long enough, T will get really big and it, it, it'll um, completely, um, it, it'll uh, annihilate the um, perturbative um, decay that we have from having higher powers of light. So it seems like perturbation theory is breaking down for sufficiently late times. And this is what's usually called secular growth. Uh, which is bad. We don't want perturbation theory to break down. It, it sounds like Hawking's picture maybe is a in problem. Um, and just uh, I'll talk a bit a little bit more about secular growth in the next slide. But uh, just to point out, there is also some other calculations in other settings. This is not a new thing. For example, Cliff Burgess and collaborators did a lot of work in Rindler space time and using under the width detectors in various space times. And this has been even further in the past known for the SIP. The, the, the secular divergences of the sitter um, that have very only very recently been resolved. That they're like there are now a handful of different approaches to calculate um, um, the the resum the secular growths in the sitter using various different versions of open effective field theory. But I have to point out that the divergence have been known since the 80s and the full solution, I think it's as early as 2018, 2019. So these can be hard, but they don't actually necessarily mean that perturbation theory breaks down. It could mean that we're just being silly about how we're defining our perturbation theory. So this is the starting point. Okay, we have this secular growth that we have these other cases appear, but maybe Hawking's, Hawking's picture is at stake. But what is this secular growth? How, why does it appear? What's the physics behind this? Roughly, then we should expect this kind of behavior whenever interactions don't die off at past or future infinity. Because roughly when we are doing our perturbative expansion, we're not actually expanding in powers of lambda or even in powers of h int. We're expanding in powers of h int times t or the integral of h int over t. And so if a, a h int doesn't go to zero as t goes to infinity, then obviously t will get really big and it'll outweigh uh, the smallness of h. Um, and this can happen well when we're curved space time because we have a background that's always gravitating and it's not turning off. For example, for Schwarzschild, it's time translation invariant, so it's always there. And that background is it's what what is making our H in not go to zero. Or for example, for finite temperature, we could have our thermal bath, and the particles are always interacting with the thermal bath. And so that, those are the kind of phenomena that we might the places where we might expect um, these kinds of secular growths, but they're not necessarily deep. For example, if we take our radioactive decay formula and expand it in powers of the gamma, we see, oh, there's a gamma T. We, we have secular growth. Well, our perturbation theory does not work for sufficiently late times. But that's obviously not true because we know what's a differential equation satisfies. We can essentially resum this and use perturbation theory to calculate gamma rather than perturbation theory to calculate N. So it doesn't necessarily mean that perturbation theory breaks down, but maybe we have to be a bit more careful about when do we use perturbation theory. And uh, for a uh, future reference, I want to split into two kinds of this secular growth. For example, for a two-point function, we can have something that grows as T1 minus T2, which is very big when T1 is very different from T2, but they could both be very big, but close to each other. Um, and this uh, wouldn't be a, a big quantity. This I'll call IR growth because it's only in the IR temporally um, that this grows. Um, there are some calculations that are already appears at one loop, expected for any finite temperature calculation. So it's very generic. Um, but because it vanishes in the coincidence limit, it doesn't actually influence the energy momentum. Factor. So it doesn't mean that we have any infinite energy. It just means that we're not being careful about the IR of the theory. And there's swaths of literature in the finite temperature uh, field that how to resum this. It's not easy, but known. Um, a much more concerning case, which is what uh, Ahmedov found and other and people we used to found in Rindler, is when it grows with T1 plus T2. This, there are some back of the envelope calculations that can only appear two loops um, and not, and even further only for when we don't use the Poincaré invariant vacua or like, or in the sitter when we use the alpha vacua. So it's not only when we use like a bad vacuum in some sense would, would these kinds of things appear. This is very concerning because it uh, influences 
Um, the energy momentum tends to, in the coincidence limit, this grows as t, so it can mean some kind of infinite energy. And also, it breaks time translation invariance. We need to have some t1 plus t2 minus t0 uh, of some kind. And so we need we have that dependence on t0. And it, this is much harder to reason. This is the kind of things that happens in the sitter when we're not careful doing the calculations. And it took like 40 years for us to have a full understanding of how to actually deal with these divergences. And th this is what seems like it's appearing in black hole collapse. So, okay, we have this secular growth, this story about interactions not dying off. This is why at the very beginning I thought I was talking about interactions dying off at future and past. This secular growth is about are, are the, can we assume the theory is free at future infinity or not? Um, and I wanted to study, I went to Bell, I had like oh, with my supervisor, I wanted to study what happens for black hole collapse. So the first thing you do in any project is you reproduce the calculations. So I, I took Akhmedov's paper and go like, okay, I want to understand this. I want to maybe bring cosmology ideas to try to resum this in the black hole case. First thing I'm gonna do is just do the calculation myself to see if I understand it. And him and everyone else involved in this field says they use the schwinger keldish formalism. So I'm gonna learn the schwinger keldish formalism and I'm gonna do the calculation. So, okay, um, what is the schwinger keldish form? Essentially, when we're doing scattering uh, amplitudes and calculations in for CERN or LHC, we use the S matrix where we put an in state, an out state with amplitude, and we calculate the am transition amplitude between these two states. Schwinger Kaldish is a bit different, also called the in formalism. Sometimes the people give a slightly different meaning to these two, but it, the, the, this one concern is too much. Where we take an initial state, we put our initial conditions, some time t, and then we evolve. And then we calculate the expectation value of some operator. This is kind of, this is an initial value formulation of QFT. So we're calculating different observables. It's more similar to what we used to do like in our undergrad in, in quantum mechanics, where we like, we put some psi of T naught, we use Schrodinger equation to evolve it, and then we calculate the expectation value of some operator. Um, and just for reference, I did not need to say the words finite temperature or non-equilibrium. It is. It turns out that when we're doing finite temperature calculations or out of equilibrium calculations, the useful observables, the observables we are interested in are captured by the in informalism. But I could take zero temperature, I can take the standard model and put it uh, in schwinger calculus. It's, it's just a matter of what I'm calculating with the theory. It's not finite temperature, uh, not the schwinger calculus needs for it to have finite temperature. Just I'm doing some initial value calculation of here. Um, so how do we do this? So obviously this formula is completely intractable. I can't do calculations with this. I have to convert this to a path input if I want to do any concrete calculations. So I'm gonna be painfully clear and the, the, show you all the details because they're gonna be important. So I start with some of uh, uh, state psi of t naught. I evolve it with my time evolution operator. I have my ket bra that I've also evolved now with u dagger and I calculate the, the expectation of some operator. I, I have to point out these arguments are just explicit time dependence. All the time dependence comes from Heisenberg or Schrodinger picture I've put in the u's outside. So they're, they're just to make things clear. So anyway, as always, when I'm trying to turn this into a path integral, I insert the identity a bunch of times. Uh, I'm gonna use quantum mechanics notation for this slide and the next, just for simplicity, turning this into QFT is very straightforward. So, okay, I insert the identity a bunch of times. And what do I get? This first term in red here, I start at, Q, at position Q4, time Q0, evolve until uh, time Tf, and uh, where I end at position Q3. This is a usual path integral that you can find in any textbook how to deal with it. What, uh, what about the U dagger? I can think of this as a usual path integral, but I'm putting a dagger in front or more useful, the dagger the same as evolving backwards in time. So I can think of it as starting at Q2 at Tf and then evolving backwards in time to Q1 at T0. So actually, instead of getting E to the Is, I get E to the minus Is. Um, and finally, I also have the matrix elements of my operator. I'll be interested in products of fields. I'm actually only gonna be interested in the symmetric two point function. So there's gonna be a Delta function and Q2 is actually equal to Q3 and they are matched at T. So what I have is what people usually call the closed time contour. I start with my kit. I evolve forwards in time with, a, with one path interval with E to the IS. I put in my operator. I match with another path interval with another set of fields that has an E to the minus IS that evolves backwards in time back to my block. And then 
I have to integrate over all possible initial conditions weighted my initial weight function. This is usually called the closed time contour because it goes from T0 to EF and back to T0, but it's not really closed because the field conditions are matched at EF, but they are not matched at T0. Um, and that's quite important. I need to know what my initial state, and actually I need to integrate over all possible initial conditions weighted by my initial weight function. Okay, so this is what I have, and putting everything together, this is the path integral that I get. Well, right here I put a, an arbitrary density matrix once more going from a pure state to a density matrix is trivial. Um, it just makes my notation slightly easier. So I have my S of Q plus, which is my forward moving field, my S of Q minus with a minus sign here, which is my backwards moving field. They are matched at TF, my operator evaluated at TF. And I have my integration over my initial conditions weighted by the matrix elements of my density matrix. And here I just demanded that this Q minus plus and Q minus, uh, Q minus naught and Q plus naught on the initial conditions of this Q minus plus. Now, okay, this is a bit of a, this is a path integral. I can maybe do calculation with this, but there are some subtleties. First of all, I cannot integrate by parts with respect to time as we used to. We usually we integrate by parts. We say, oh, boundary conditions vanish. We complete the square. We have propagators. We move forwards. Here, I I'll get a finite boundary condition in T naught, and actually I have to even integrate over all possible initial conditions. So I have to be quite careful when I'm do, deriving what is the propagator, what are the, uh, the field theories, because I have I, this integration over initial time complicates matters quite a lot. I need to know what row is. But even if I'm brave enough and I, I choose a row, I know what row is, is some free state, for example, I can uh, turn this initial uh, position calculation in the other, I have an S of Q plus and an S of Q minus. I imagine I have two propagators, one for Q plus and one for Q minus with maybe some complications here. But that's not true because Q plus is equal to Q minus at the F. So there's some mixing there. And it's as if my uh, I had some quadratic mixing instead of just having to action sum. So I'm going to have a propagator that goes from Q plus to Q minus. So instead of just having two propagators or even those one propagator that we usually like, we have a two by two matrix of propagators. And this is what's usually the crux of Schringer calculus. You have twice as many diamonds. You have Q plus, Q minus, and you have mixing between them. It's, it gets more involved. It gets technically more, um, well, cumbersome because we have so many more diagrams, but we can do this. It's something we can work with. And I stuck here, okay, I understand this. Now I'm going to look at Medoff's papers and I'm going to do the same calculations. But this is where, uh, well, minor or major, depending on your point of view, descent into madness happened because I could not understand how people were doing calculations in this. Be my main problem, and I, I like now about six months ago, I went to a group meeting in Dan and I asked this question and no one knew the answer. Like, I was really confused. So the first thing, I need to know what row is. I, I emphasize this. I need to know what my initial conditions are in order to solve my path. But I, one, in terms of peer states, I know one of them. I know the, the vacuum. I know how to write that down, and I know how to do calculations with a vacuum. For a free theory, because I don't really know how to do a vacuum for an interacting theory, I can do perturbation theory, sure. Maybe, but that's... I want to do perturbation theory after, right? It's complicated. Maybe I can do something, but it's complicated. But maybe I can do it what people usually do, and they put the time at minus infinity, you do I have some prescription, and you assume the theory is free. But the whole thing was that, if, for example, if I'm in Schwarzschild or finite temperature, I have a background that's always there, that's not turned off. And that's what's generating my secular growth. And that's the, the interaction is not dying out with T equals my plus infinity. But they're also not dying out as t goes to minus infinity. So can I assume that the theory is free at past infinity? With the i epsilon prescription, you're not deriving that the theory is free. You are assuming, and then you're jamming it into the theory by putting that i epsilon there to, to really project into the free theory. I'm not sure if I can assume that the theory is free if I can use the vacuum. So I was very confused because people just do I have some prescription? Never justify. Even when, even in the sitter where or FLRW where you don't have time transition invariance, I have zero expectation that the theory should be free. Um, why can we assume this? I'm not sure. Maybe I don't want to assume this. And even then, it doesn't matter because if I want to study secular growth, I need to have a T1 plus T2, and I know I will get T1 plus T2 minus T0. 
So I'll actually have that initial time there. So if I put a minus infinity, I'll just see infinity and I can't deal with it. So I need to somehow be able to put initial conditions at some finite time, then do my symmetric two point function at some uh, other finite time, t1 plus t2, so that this difference is finite. And then I can see the secular growth. I can look at it and see it and maybe try to solve it. Whereas if I put t0 equals minus infinity, I just see a divergence and I can't do much. Um, so I want to have some controlled way to write it down. So I want to put minus conditions at T0. And even despite my doubts that the theory is free at past infinity, everyone agrees that the theory is not free at some finite time. If you're at finite time, of course, the theory isn't free. Even like at zero temperature, the particles are now a finite distance away and they interact, even if the interactions are local. They, 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 if the T0 is finite, the theory surely isn't free. So I need to know how to write down a state for an interacting theory at some finite time in the past. There is one state which I managed to understand how to do this, which is finite temperature, the Gibbs state, where rho is equal to e to minus theta h. And why can I do this for interacting theory? Because I can put vh here, not just h naught, as is usually done, as you'll see in the future. But also, this looks like a time evolution except it's an imaginary time. So this looks my, like my time evolution operator. And I know how to write down these time evolution operators in terms of path integral. It just so happens it's a path integral in imaginary time, but that's fine, I can deal with it. And it's just another path. So I get the third field, which is doing the integration over initial val uh, over the initial conditions, which is just doing this, um, which is just a path integral that goes from T0 to T0 minus T0. And this actually even works if my h is not time independent, if my h depends on time, I just have to be careful and evaluate h at t naught, and then do this evolution in imaginary time with my explicit time dependence of h evaluated at t naught. Okay, so I can do, I, I have a state that I can work with. It's a bit more complicated. Maybe at the end, I can actually do the vacuum by doing, by phrasing the calculations in terms of finite temperature and then taking the beta goes to infinity because then I'll project to the vacuum, like just the ground state of the Hamiltonian, that definition of vacuum. And maybe then I can do Ahmedo's calculation in a, in a bit more controlled way. But then I still have my second ascent in minus because okay, this is my new path integral. I have my Q plus, my Q minus, and I have my Q Euclid, which is uh, an imaginary time where now it has a minus so because it's in, in Euclidean signature. And I have my Q plus and Q minus matched in TF. And the, um, what appears here is the integration over the matrix elements of rho. And so the matrix, the, 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 the states that I put in rho are the initial conditions for Q plus and Q minus. And those will be the initial and final conditions for my U here, my U in imaginary time. So actually Q minus a T naught, will be Q Euclidean at zero, and Q plus at T naught will be Q, Q Euclidean at beta. So I have this kind of loopy path conditions where I start at T, uh, Q plus at T naught, um, go to Q plus at TF, change to Q minus, go back to T naught, change to QE, and then go back to beta, and then go back to Q plus. Um, these loopy boundary conditions allow me to integrate by parts, except there is derivative boundary conditions. Uh, which I didn't need to impose earlier because I just I just didn't put the identity, which is some state, um, which is the position that doesn't have to do with momentum. But it turns out that so I can choose whatever derivatives I wanted about. It's just free to choose. Um, I can show you the argument for this later, but I can choose these boundary conditions that just allow me to integrate by parts. So all the boundary terms cancel. So I've dealt with subtlety number one, which is I can integrate by parts. I get some propagators and I can do friendly. Okay, so, so, the, so that's better. I'm a bit better than having to do that hardcore initial state calculation, but I have three fields. And this is the loopy boundary condition. I start T naught, go to TF, go back to T naught, go to T naught minus high beta, and then match back. So this is now genuinely a closed time contour. Previously, the second subtlety was because of the matching at TF with Q plus and Q minus, instead of having one propagator for Q plus and one propagator for Q minus, I actually had a two by two matrix. I have this mixing between Q plus and Q minus. But now I have a matching at TF, but I also have a matching at T naught to zero and a T naught minus I beta with T naught. So obviously if I have three fields, they're all matched. As usual, as before, instead of giving a two by two, instead of having three propagators with, for my three fields, I have a three by three matrix of propagators. This is the logical conclusion. That's what I primed you to think. 
And this is the question that I asked all these months ago in my group meeting, this should be true. And, and no one knew the answer because no one in my group actually did these calculations, had seen this calculation this much detail, so they didn't know. But because all of the literature, everywhere that I could find, literally everywhere, every textbook, use the two by two matrix and uh, to do actual calculations. And this confused me for so long and it took so long for me to actually find the reference that argued correctly because what they, th there are several degrees of honesty in the literature. Some books just never mentioned that the, it should be three by three, never mentioned that there should be a mix in between the Euclidean and the real fields. They just say we have Schwinger Keldish, but we impose some periodicity and we're done. Some books say they are zero and then move forward. They chronologically should exist, but then they say, oh, but actually they are zero. When they're not, you can do the calculation, you can calculate them and they're not zero. So that's a bit more honest, but still not very honest. Then people say, oh, they vanish as t goes to minus infinity. And they, oh, there, there's a question, go for it. Uh, yes, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I was a bit lost. Can you remind us again why you have a new uh, branch uh, here uh, of, on your integration control, the one on the imaginary axis? It comes from uh, implementing in practice this I epsilon prescription. Uh, no, 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 repeat the arguments? The, the, the imaginary contour comes from the finite temperature state. So now I'm inserting as here, instead of uh, this row that I'm putting is e to the minus beta h. And the way that I code this e to the minus beta h is by putting this evolution in imaginary time. And then the matrix elements for this evolution in imaginary time look like a path integral, just, eval uh, the, just the time evolution goes from t naught to t naught minus i beta. So I have a third path integral that's calculating oh. This. At, at, at zero temperature, this would not be there. And exactly. But at zero temperature, I don't know how to do the calculation because I don't know how to put an interacting vacuum at some finite time t naught. My point of putting the temperature is that I know how to do the calculation. Isn't, isn't what is supposed to do the I epsilon prescription exactly? The I epsilon prescription, the problem is that it is assuming that the theory is free when you're putting the initial conditions. And that is precisely the thing that I want to test. And also yes. at, teen, at some finite time in the past, the theory is not free. The theory may only be free, at the other, is maybe free at past infinity. And I'm not sure I want to assume this, maybe I want to derive that. Um, but at some finite but at time- least, At least in the theory, it should make sense that uh, your theory, uh, I think that's a free theory, no? I mean, in, in the maybe, theory, maybe I'm biased the because I don't the know well the- sub -hubble, But also the metric mm -hmm. is becoming singular. So like it's, you can argue both way, depending on the patch of the sitter, you can maybe do some arguments for one way or the other. Um, but in the sitter, usually um, it is a good assumption that that is more well defined. But in Schwarzschild, there's a time transition invariance, the background is not turned off. Or finite temperature, there's a background that's never turned off. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So then we have these three components. Um, and for, um, and okay, there are some reviews that actually say the limit of something goes to zero as t goes to minus infinity and that something has constant modulus. So it doesn't go to zero. And then I found some review from the seventies that actually gave me the honest answer, which is if you assume that the theory is free at past infinity and you take the t goes to minus infinity limit, then the cross terms vanish. Both things must be true. It's not just going to past infinity, uh, it's past, going to past infinity and assuming that the theory is free at past infinity, which is simply doing I epsilon prescription just with finite temperature. And that is the assumption, which number one, it's a questionable assumption because if I have finite temperature, I have this background that I'm not turning off. The, the, the particles should always, should be constantly interacting with the background, even in Minkowski. So I find it questionable that the theory should be free. But further than that, I don't, can't take T0 goes to minus infinity. I want to see secular growth. I need the T1 plus T2 minus T0. I need that interval to be finite. So I can't assume, but like, I may question the validity of this assumption and I will question it even further in the next few slides, 
but at least as a starting point, I can't assume it. So I need to understand how can I write perturbation theory, even for Minkowski, with this three by three uh, matrix. So this is why the paper is about Minkowski at finite temperature and not about Schwarzschild, because it turned out that even doing the calculation for Schwarzschild, they had interesting physics. Um, and I'll talk about then the calculation that I'm doing right now to uh, uh, after I show you the calculation in Minkowski. So now I'm going to, so even though my motivation was to talk about Schwarzschild, that turns out there, there are layers and layers of questions before I can reach that question in Schwarzschild. So in this talk for the last 20 or so minutes that I have, I'm gonna talk about what I've actually written on a paper. What happens if I have just Minkowski space-time at finite temperature? Does the thing behave as we expect? Do these terms actually go to zero? Do they not go to zero? What happens? Punchline is they don't go to zero. We can't assume the theory is free to pass infinity, but I'll show you the calculation. So what do we want to calculate? We want to calculate something physical. The most physical thing that I can think of is the energy momentum denser. The, I don't want to do the full regularization, so I'm going to actually calculate the symmetric two-point function. And I'm going to do the finite temperature and at finite T naught. And if I then want to do some vacuum calculation, I take the beta goes to infinity. I'll use the finite temperature as a regulator for them need to take the beta goes to infinity limit to define what I mean by vacuum. Okay, so with all that in mind, what I've argued in the past half hour is that we need the three by three propagator matrix and my Schwinger Calder's path for with three fields. Now it's a bunch of technical things, and I'm going to just tell you the general lessons that I learned because to solve this is a bit trickier than what's there. There are techniques in the literature, but they, they have different assumptions, and to actually solve this, uh, it, there, there, there are some tricks. So, first of all, because we have these loopy boundary conditions, and because we can choose the derivatives at each point, with the, all the boundary terms cancel and we can integrate by parts, we have to include the off diagonal terms. That was the whole point. And with the end, we get is a three by three matrix, so nine couple PDEs for the propagators. Because I'm interested maybe in Rindler and maybe Schwarzschild, uh, cosmology has been solved, so maybe I don't want to, I, I'm not that interested in it anymore. Um, I want to do stuff that has some time um, translation invariants. Those are the main things that I, examples that I can think of. So maybe I want to be really general. I, I'm okay. I want to do calculation I'm in Minkowski to actually do it. But if I assume that it's Minkowski as late as possible, maybe that's good. And I solve for the time bit first, and then I solve for the spatial bit. I can do it. Uh, the problem is when I'm doing this contour, I'll get a factor of i coming from the imaginary time bit, a factor of minus coming from the backwards in time bit. And those factors just ruin every method that I try to hammer at it. I can try to think of it as a contour in the complex plane, but then these factors always appear to ruin my time transition invariance. I can shove them to so many places, to the delta functions, to the time derivatives, to the spatial derivatives, to the final integration, to the boundary conditions. I can, I've learned so many ways to almost solve these PDEs, but I couldn't actually solve them. Uh, at least that way. Or maybe I thought, okay, I have three compact intervals. Maybe I can do some four-year series. But then because it has to be discontinuous, it ruins the boundary conditions. I, I couldn't find a way. If anyone has practiced with this and no way to solve for the time bit first without solving for the spatial operator, do let me know. I'd love to know, uh, but I couldn't do it. What I could do, where it works for Minkowski and it works for Rindler, I'm not sure if it's going to work for Schwarzschild, is to solve for the spatial bit first. In Minkowski, I can just free transform and reduce to quantum mechanics. In Rindler, you need something more sophisticated. It's called the kontorovich lebedev transform. Uh, and in the end, you also reduce back to quantum mechanics. And then the, the 1D system, you shove it into Mathematica, and in 20 seconds, you get an answer uh, because it's easy. Um, so they, they, these are just the general lessons. Um, and finally, in the end, I get the three by three matrix, all elements are around zero, but obviously it has many symmetry. The plus and the minus are just one, one is the dagger of the other. The Euclidean is just a, um, a weak rotation. Obviously all the three fields are very related there. There's many symmetries going on here. And this is one thing all of the literature is correct because as usual, everything except the difficulty of the problem is basis invariant. And there is a good basis to do the calculations and there is a bad basis to do the calculations. The bad basis is the, is the plus minus E basis, that's a terrible basis to do the calculations. A much better basis is the average difference basis, also called the RA basis or the 
um, retarded advanced spaces, but I'm going to call it average difference because what we deal is with the average field and with the difference field. We get many zeros and a lot more symmetries. In the end, the, I get four independent properties um, in, my, in my theory, which are here in all its glory. Um, I should point out that the average average and the uh, different average uh, propagators, these first two, they agree with what is found in the literature. So my calculations have a chance of being correct. Uh, oh, M here, I'm, I'm using quantum mechanics notation again. If you want to do QFT, you have to, wherever you see M, you have to replace it with the energy, square root of P squared plus M squared. Um, Euclidean, the fields, I can also verify it very easily because it's just a weak rotation of the real fields. Um, but the new one is the cross term, average Euclidean. The difference Euclidean is zero. And I can look at this and I can give it precision, say, hold on. What? If I take T naught goes to minus infinity, you can see that this is not zero. This is a cosine. It doesn't go to zero at, at, at infinity. Even if I do an I epsilon prescription um, in any direction, it doesn't go to zero. But that's, that's not actually true. If you do the I epsilon prescription carefully, you'll see that the two exponentials in the cosine will get two different signs for the I epsilon. So actually with the I epsilon prescription, this does seem like it goes to zero, which is, in my language, this is what the literature's argument translates to. This is what essentially their argument for neglecting these terms is saying, I do I have some prescription, this goes to zero and I move forward. That is, the people have phrased it in different ways, but that's how to see it in my language. I, and further beyond just us getting just these four propagators, we already got some zeros. You notice that the difference average has a theta function here. So T2 has to be bigger than T1, which may actually close loops with the, these diagram with these propagators will evaluate to zero. There's a kind of a causal flow coming from the difference in the average fields that people have related to actual causality. Um, so there, there's even further simplification happening. Uh, these are my final rules. Um, I'm just showing them for notation where dotted lines mean Euclidean and arrows point towards average fields. So the average average has two arrows and the difference average has an arrow pointing to the uh, average field. Uh, same for the Euclidean one. I also have three vertices. Um, one with just Euclidean's, one with three different averages, one difference, and one with three differences, and one average. And they differ by a factor four because of the weird normalization between the average and the difference. But okay, these are my Feynman rules. Just have to do it. Um, I have this first diagram that comes from the just the real fields. I can see there's two T naught dependences, one that seems maybe a bit concerning, and one that's inside the cosine that if I do the I have some prescription, it seems like it goes to zero. Okay, then you have the second diagram, which there's a minus sign here, which means this dependence canceled, which is good. Uh, the cosine doesn't cancel, but I can still maybe send it to zero. And finally, there's my new term. First thing that I want to point out is the small t naught here, because this cosine is exactly the same as this cosine. There's a plus sign here, there's a minus sign here, which means the Euclidean bit is canceling the real bit. So even though previously we had to do the absolute prescription to get rid of the T naught dependence, when I sum over all three, that is natural, which for me is very satisfying. It's a bit prettier. It's not an inconsistency with the other theory, but it's a bit prettier. And then we have the inconsistency with the previous theory, which is my red term in here. You notice that it does not depend on T naught anywhere. And it, it is finite as T1 goes to minus T2. It is just there. There's nothing that I can do about it. And it means that, even though these legs here seem to go to zero before, when I take the limit before, afterwards, if I take the absolute uh, prescription, this term goes to zero, but this one doesn't. It's, uh, so there's some inconsistency. I, this term is what really makes me believe that the theory at, for Minkowski at finite temperature is not free at past infinity and that we should not neglect the mixing between the Euclidean and the real. This is the final answer where I just put it all together. And if you notice, I'm calculating the phi average, phi average um, expectation value, which is what corresponds to the um, symmetric function. But I, I still have, this is just my loop integral and this, this cosh term here really, and notice that it is finite as T1 equals T2. So this actually means it contributes to the energy momentum density. This has energy. Um, the, the measure, if we do like, I imagine if we do easing model and calculate the energy, we will see this term. 
but I'll, I'll argue a bit later why why the, the, I'm not actually going against the square root. But anyway, um, I have this loop integral that I have to regularize. Um, I could go back and do the usual adding counter terms and then putting the do, adding all the diagrams with the counter terms. That is a bit hard because especially for the field renormalization, I'll need some time derivatives. And here I'm treating the space and time derivatives a bit different. Um, so it's going to be a bit messy dealing with that. A uh, much neater way is to take the tree level propagators and expand in powers of m or delta z. With delta z, you have to do some rescalings, but it's fine. And actually, I quite like this way of doing things because it it's more closer to the spirit of what I learned in my QFT class, which is like we want to find out what is the parameter that matches to our physical definition of particles. Um, so I, 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 it's cool. Anyway, I just expand this, and this is what I get expanding a three level propagator. And I checked it gives the same as having all the diagrams. Uh, I beat is just my loop integral. Um, now I want some physical definition of mass. But uh, there's no column lamel spectral representation for finite beta. And furthermore, the mass, my physical definition of mass is the gap in the Hamiltonian. That is a property of the Hamiltonian, not of the initial state. So the mass should not depend on the initial state. Also, any parameter in the Hamiltonian should not depend on the initial state. The Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian, and I can put whatever initial state I want. So it makes no sense for the mass or delta z or lambda or whatever to depend on beta. So what I do, I take the beta goes to infinity limit first. Then I do color limit spectral representation in the zero temperature limit. And then I use that definition of mass. And that counter term should cancel the divergences, divergences for all initial states. OK, so this is what I get. This is for my spectral representation. Actually, would you get something with a delta prime? But that just comes from expanding this delta, because this delta is first order in lambda. And this is what I get for the counterterms, which match the usual counter terms that you get if you do um, just an S matrix calculation. Um, and this is uh, after regularization, this is the result that I get, where uh, you'd note that the, the, even though each of these integrals is divergent, their difference is actually fine. So I've accomplished the thing that I meant of like the um, zero temperature counter term canceling the finite temperature divergences, which we should. Also, from a physical standpoint, this makes sense because these divergences are UV. And the temperature is an IR phenomenon. So at the UV, it shouldn't really matter that we have a temperature and, and, and the, the, the result should be the same. Um, I'll, I'll reiterate the point that this is independent of T0. And I needed to sum all three diagrams to get that independence of T0. I have this extra term here at the end that does not depend on T0 and can only come from the cross terms, and even further. Notice how the way I did my mass counter term, I put it in the free theory, and it spat out this cosec term. If I had put it, imagine I had started um, just with the two by two matrix and putting the um, counter terms in the interacting piece, I would not see this cosec terms. And I'll say, oh, I, I've taken care of all divergences, which is what you usually see, do see in finite temperature literature. But if I had then put it in the free piece and, and expanded back, I would have seen the cosec term. So if I use the two by two matrix, I will see a difference whether I put my counter term in the free part of the Hamilton or the interacting part of the Hamilton, which obviously makes no sense. It, like it can't, it can't depend on when I expand, if I expand before or after. Like, and in here I get the same answer. So once more, it, uh, my result with the three by three matrix uh, is much more mathematically consistent than the two by two matrix. Um, I've also checked this kind of behavior for the other propagators for the commutator, for the time ordered one. They all behave the same uh, the same way with having the, um, the, the, the same counter term working for all of them. Um, and there's also this term that goes as T1 minus T2, which has some IR growth. But this can be, this is fairly easy to, to resum. This can be resummed just by changing the mass parameter. Because if, if you look at this, the counter term, if I had put in an I beta rather than an I infinity, then this would go to zero. That means of kind of having a temperature dependent mass would resum my divergences. Obviously, my actual mass is not temperature dependent. I've argued a bit that that makes no sense. But what it means is taking the tree level propagator and putting there a mass parameter but some adding some temperature dependent piece, that is the same as resumming my um, perturbation. Um, 
there are some arguments in the finite temperature literature why this works. This, this is my claim that this always works. Uh, obviously, I have some extra terms, so I haven't proven that it always works, but we needn't be too concerned about this. Um, so this is, the, now for, for conclude, I think the main question that you should have here, which is what I've been alluding already a bit, is why has this not been noted before? This is phi to the fourth, Minkowski finite temperature. This could correspond to some easing model or something very measurable. How can we have how can we have missed this? And the first thing is, like I said, if you take the two by two matrix and you put the counter terms in the interaction piece and you never put it in the free theory, because who would do that? that, that no one does that. Then you never see these cosage terms, you just see these two, both in the counter terms and without the counter terms. You get to the resummation, you get to the um, canceling the divergences, you get the IR growth, and you get the resummation. And the resummation you find is correct. So the two by two matrix gives you the correct resummation. Then, if you work with the resum theory and never expand back, you get the same answer because the resum theory actually contains the cosage terms, you just didn't know. What they would notice if they try to expand back, they would see they had an extra term, but they never did. Um, and there are some physical reasons for this. Is like, I, at some level, I can put whatever initial conditions I want. I, I can put the physical initial of finite temperature, or I can put a, a row that is e to the minus beta h naught. I can put that in, as an initial row. It is not doing a finite temperature calculation, but it is a valid initial condition. And the deep IR like, should not care about which initial conditions we use. The, the deep IR is badly behaved in both cases, and the, the resummation is the same. So essentially, there's some like independent, even if I use sick initial conditions, I can still guess what the correct in, uh, uh, IR resummation should be. Finally, in the, my last couple of minutes, um, there are two other formalisms to do finite temperature calculations, which I should address. One is the imaginary time formalism, which deals with a state a static uh, uh, situation where we have weak rotators and just equilibrium and static observables. So they compute different things. Like, for example, they can't compute my energy momentum tensor at time evolution, but that's not their point. They're, they're trying to compute something else. So they're hard to, to compare with the Schwinger Kaldish, but there are some results of what you can do some analytic continuation to relate the two. And obviously, I'm not going against the imaginary time formalism. That is absolutely correct. For, for the observable that they are trying to compute. But uh, when you're trying to compare, like trying to compare, compute some obs uh, unobservable in imaginary time and get that answer for different observable in, in different in real time, there are different observables, but there are some continuation. That continuation only works if the theory is um, uh, free at past infinity. Essentially, the analytic, the, the, the analytic continuation, the analyticity assumes the theory is free. If the theory is not free, then the, the, the assumptions behind deriving analyticity are, are not satisfied. Um, so that's why I'm not necessarily going against the imaginary time formalism, because the limit in which they can be mapped the, the, the reason why they can be mapped breaks down. And the thermal field double, well, I'm definitely also arguing that it's wrong because it's assuming even worse. It's assuming the theory is free of both past and future infinity, which is, well, I really do not trust this. <laughs> um, I'll just leave the slide here for um, future work. I'm now doing the Rindler calculation, which is a bit more technically challenging than I hoped for, but it's in progress, should be out in a couple months hopefully before I finish my PhD and black holes, that's more complicated because we don't have you eat. It's, it's harder to solve the spatial equation and that that is um, something that I'll have to think about while I'm postdoc. Um, thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, talk and uh, for uh, not going beyond the 15 minutes. Uh, I think there is a uh, time for questions, so just uh, if you want to ask something, uh, go ahead. I don't think uh, you need to uh, to raise your hand or anything. Hi, uh, thanks for this interesting talk. Hey. Um, yeah, I have a question about this analytic continuation. Usually, you know, um, we say, at least when you're in thermal equilibrium, uh, it's sufficient to know one propagator, all the others, you know, there's fluctuation dissipation theorem, et cetera, et cetera. 
which I guess is based on analytic continuation. You, you, the symmetric Green's function, which you calculate, you know, it's you you, you can you you can always calculate all the other Green's functions if you know one of them, right? Um, and that that is uh, my impression was this is sort of a very 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 basic uh, property of the theory. Uh, but now you say this actually assumes something which sounds like unrealistic that the theory is free in the infinite past. It's it's basic. In, it, it depends on. It, it slightly depends on what you mean, because that analytic continuation is essentially mapping two different kind of observables. And if you're mapping the correct observable, for example, if you're mapping what's the thermal mass shift, then you get you you always get the correct answer. And for like. So in some cases it does work, but when you are, what, what I did look at was specifically, if you have imaginary time, you prove some analyticity properties of the real time thing that you're trying to map to. And you say, because this is an analytic, I can analytically continue to the Euclidean piece and then compute that Euclidean piece and analytically continue back. But when you're doing analyticity properties, it really, relies or like you only understand those analyticity properties if the state is as if the theory was free. If you have e to the beta h and not e to the beta uh, h naught, I don't think we understand what's the full analytic properties of that, uh, of even the two, uh, of the two point um, function. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the did question? You, I think I, I was a bit roundabout, but I, I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> Did you check some more complicated theories like gauge theories? Because it's- I, know, I, I did not at all. A thermal mass which you calculate, you have a device screening, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, there are different mass scales which, which you can compute. And... That is a great question. I didn't, <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Because um, essentially, if even for the scalar it doesn't work, I had very little hope that it would work for the other ones. So that's why I didn't bother checking. But you would expect that the thing works because I mean, fluctuation dissipation theorem is something so fundamental. Uh, it, it would be, um, I, I would think the formula- No, it could be the gauge theories are more well behaved. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, that, that's a good question. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, more questions? Okay, I have one. Uh, I know you haven't done the calculation yet, but uh, what do you expect, I mean, intuitively uh, to happen in the black hole case? My, my, I had an answer that I, had, that I gave like the five times that I gave this talk and a, a week ago, I think I changed my mind, but I'm gonna give you the answer that I gave for months, which is there was a, there's a back of the envelope calculation you can do just for free theory um, that essentially argues that you shouldn't see anything wrong if you put the correct state, essentially. So my expectation was that you would definitely, if you put the Schwarzschild temperature, or you wouldn't see anything wrong. You wouldn't see no secular growth, everything would be fine. But if you put maybe some other temperature, you would see something going wrong. That, that, that was my expectation. More recently, I'm, I've been shown other calculations um, by, by Ahmed of group because I've been in contact with them. And maybe any temperature is fine. Uh, at least in Minkowski, it's true that any temperature is fine. You don't see anything wrong with it, with, with finite temperature. Uh, you don't see any secular growth. You only see secular growth for non-thermal states. So I'm not sure. Well, now I'm a bit questioning whether, because there are two, either any temperature is fine and I only see secular growth for non-thermal states or these alpha vacua kind of states, or I see a problem if I put the wrong temperature. And that's essentially the thing that I'm trying to capture with doing the Rindler calculation, uh, which is I'm trying to see whether the Rindler calculation has a preference for a particular temperature, whether the under temperature is different from any other old temperature. Um, bec yeah, because essentially there, there, are two, there are two dials. There's the dial of which temperature I'm using, and there's a dial of which Hamiltonian I'm using, which de definition of time. And I'm not sure which of the dials is the thing that gives me the secular growth. And that's one thing that I want to study. Okay. Um, uh, any more questions? 
okay your last chance uh, okay if there are no more questions uh, let's thank uh, joao again for the nice talk and um, this is it okay thank you very thank much you. Well, thank you, Joao. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you at uh, the IFT uh, sometime. Uh, yes, I'd love to visit. <laughs> let's hope that uh, next uh, course things will be more uh, normal, and uh, and then you can uh, visit us. Okay. Yeah, I, I can I can come back to give you the update of what happens for Black Hole. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> that would be nice. Okay, uh, so I'm going to close uh, the meeting. Uh, so thank you very much again. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, see you. Bye.